Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be together, the opportunity that we have to examine your word, the opportunity we have for your word to examine us. And Lord, even though that is a painful process, we thank you that you are faithful through that process. You are with us in that process, and you've promised to be working that process out and ultimately completing that process. And so we are so grateful that we can look to you and we can trust in you in the midst of all of this. We pray these things and ask your blessing on our time together. Amen. All right, so last week we talked about this question and we talked through that sheet and if you weren't here, please read through that sheet and I encouraged everyone to memorize everything on that sheet. Memorize those three statements. My goal in life is to please God. I, I please God by becoming like Jesus. God knows I will not be perfect but expects me to be growing. And those verses that go with it. And if this becomes part of the fabric of your life, then in when a situation arises, which is like every moment of your life is a situation, right? But when a difficult situation arises in your life, if this question is on your heart and mind, what is my goal in life? How can I engage in this in a way that is pleasing to God? That is so helpful. Now, um, I was having a conversation this last week, and I don't think I emphasize strongly enough the motivation for becoming like Jesus. That's our second thing there. I please God by becoming like Jesus. The reason we love him is what? Because he first loved us. 2 Corinthians 5 says the love of Christ, as in his love for us, compels us. Jesus said, he who's been forgiven much loves much. And so the reason that we even can work at pleasing God is because in Jesus, we actually already are pleasing to God. I want to point that out. If you are in Christ, God is pleased with you. If you are in Christ, you are his child. And if you are in Christ and you are seeking him and failing, well, when your child is trying to please you and failing, that still pleases you as a parent. And so I want us to know this isn't some legalistic pursuit of becoming like Jesus in order to satisfy him. No, this is we recognize that in Christ we are pleasing to God. Because of what Christ did, because of the perfect righteousness that he accomplished for us, and that has been credited to us, we should go through life with this profound sense of, of awe, the fact that God actually counts us as righteous. The fact that God has actually adopted us into his family. And so when we talk about becoming more like Jesus, there's a sense in which we already are. Right? And what we already are scripturally is what we're pushing toward. And that's a weird tension. God has made all these things true. We, we have been credited with Christ's righteousness and we have been made part of the family of God and there's nothing that we can do to revoke that and yet because of that because it's free because we can't earn it we are motivated to strive after holiness and to become more like Jesus and so we tend to err most of us on the side of feeling like we need to work for God's approval. If you are a Christian, you have 
God's approval because you are in Christ. And so there's a very great difference between your motivation um, and, and there's a very great difference between trying to earn God's favor by being, coming like Jesus and knowing that you have God's favor and therefore wanting to become like Jesus. Those are going to be two very different pursuits that may look the same on the outside, but one will be full of joy and actual motivation, and the other will be a begrudging, dutiful existence of slogging through and trying to do something that you don't actually want to do. And so I want to make sure that that is clear um, from the beginning as we're pursuing sanctification in our relationships in marriages or helping marriages around us or looking forward or back at marriage as we're pursuing our own sanctification we have to do that from the position that we are already in God's family he is already pleased with us so feedback how does it change your pursuit of Christ knowing that you are already secure in him and that you don't have to earn his favor? How does that change your pursuit of holiness? I, I think I, I view it in, initially pursue him and it's a it's a good and right thing I, I, so I don't know what to call it except success in, in that light sure so does everyone understand the questions there's there's two you could pursue Christ because you want to you want to earn his favor or you could pursue Christ because you already know that you have his favor how does this side knowing that you already have his favor how does that how does that help you? How does that change the way you view sanctification? It goes from being like a chore to being something that you like want to do. It's something that you find that you like you don't need to, but you would like to do it. Okay. So it becomes a lot less stressful. Okay. Yeah, I would piggyback off that. The word that comes to my mind is just freedom. I'm not trying to earn something. I'm not trying to please God to get me some kind of security or something. I'm now free to love God out of thankfulness for what he's done, which is just freedom and joy as opposed to, yeah, stressful. Right. Yeah. I think it, the focus is different. The one kind of the focus is me, I need to mm -hmm. earn his favor, and the other one the focus is just getting to know the Lord because of who he is. Right. So maybe it just changes the focus. Yeah, absolutely. Right, 2 Corinthians 3 says that we are transformed as we behold his glory. And so if we are constantly looking at ourselves, trying to figure out if I'm doing enough to please God, then we are constantly going to question our standing. But if our gaze is on Christ and beholding his glory, then our hearts will begin to be transformed and we will find that we have motivation that perhaps we didn't have before so i just wanted to make that clear and if you weren't here last week again i would encourage you to read through this and commit these particular verses to memory because this is this is a paradigm this is a way to view life that helps you think through all of Really, all of life and our responses to life. Okay, now, we finished, we were talking about presuppositions last week. We finished with the reality or the, the, the question, what's the most dangerous thing to a marriage? And 
I said the most dangerous thing to your marriage is believing things that aren't true. Any comments on that if you've had a chance to think about that or hear it a second time? Why, why is that true? That believing things that aren't true is the most dangerous thing to your marriage? They aren't true. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Okay, someone expand on that a little bit. I think if, if we believe things that aren't true, that's going to be something that can come between you and your, in this case, your spouse. Okay. It's, it's not true, and it's going to act as a division. Okay. Yep. What else? Well, anytime you believe something that's not true, it's a foundation of a lie. Yep. Sure. Now, why do we do what we do? He doesn't want to. Okay, yes. Which is based on what we believe to be true. Right. Why do we want what we want is because we believe what we believe. And so, the, the most dangerous thing for your marriage or your relationships or the marriages around you is believing things that aren't true because what we believe... The heart, the, biblically, the heart is the control center. The mind is the control center. The inner you is the control center of the outer you. And so if the control center is infected, if you will, with lies, then the outer you is going to produce bad fruit. Can I? Yeah. Good. I couldn't hear what she said. Um, every sin is based on some sort of lie. From the beginning, Satan's temptation in the garden was a lie. Some, something tr that was not true about God and it led them into sin. And that is always going to be true. That if you believe a lie, you will sin in result of it. Okay, so we're talking about presuppositions for marriage. And the idea is, what do we... What do we already believe? What's underneath our actions even when we come to the conversation about marriage? And so the first question is, what do you believe about God's word and the priority of God's word for your marriage? Everyone turn to 2 Peter 1.3. Hebrews, James, Peter. Everything, everything that you need to know about marriage is in God's word. Now, I think because, you know, we come to this church, most of us would, like, agree with that technically, but actually, we might not actually believe that as much as we think we do. So when I say that we know everything we need to know about marriage from God's word, I'm not, like... I actually mean everything. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And it goes on to talk about 
the promises of God. And so the essence of this is God has given us through his spirit and by his word and in conjunction with his people, he has given us everything that we need to live. And it says everything for life, that would just be like going through life, and godliness, to actually do that in a way like we talked about, in a way that would be pleasing to God. God's word actually does provide that much for us. Now, our culture has all sorts of addendums to that statement. Well, yeah, God's word, well, depending on what quadrant of the culture. But if you are in like a Christian-ish quadrant of the culture, they'll say, well, yeah, God's word is good, but you actually really need, or God's word is helpful, but not fully sufficient. And we have to recognize that we have been getting culturally for decades messages that are intended to undermine our confidence in God's word. We've been getting messages that say, yeah, God's word is this, but you also need this. Yeah, God's word is this, but you also need this. And we need to recognize that even everything that we have now with modern science and medicine, this passage has been true for the last 2,000 years. So all the people who didn't have modern science and medicine, they had everything that they needed for life and godliness too. And so if we are... Uh, I think it's C.S. Lewis talks about chronological snobbery. We think that we're better because of where we are on the timeline. And so if we think, well, science and medicine were so much farther advanced than they were, and if we're not careful, we begin to insert that sort of thinking into our presuppositions about marriage. What do we need in marriage? Well, we need... God's word and we need God's word plus and God's word for the last 2,000 years has been saying God has actually given us everything we need. Christians in the first century, second century, third century, fourth century, fifth century and on have had all they needed for life and godliness in their marriages so that their marriages could be honoring to the Lord, so that their marriages could flourish and grow in God's design apart from science and medicine. And so I want to make that really clear that God invented marriage, and so what he says about marriage is actually enough for us. And we have to believe that because our, presupposition, our presuppositions will have a measurable effect on our marriage. Now, I want you to consider some marriages that are close to you. Could be yours, could be someone else's. Just think about them for a second, roll them through your mind. Now, how would you rate... Okay, now what we're going to do is we're not rating our own marriages. Just that's clear in the room. If you were to think about some marriages around you, and you were to rate them 1 to 10, give me some numbers. Think of a specific marriage in your mind. Think if you were to rate that marriage 1 to 10. Um... 10 being flourishing, godly, I want that marriage. One being miserable and whatever else you might categorize the bad side of marriage. How about miserable for only one person in the marriage? Yeah, that would, that would be, that'd be a low number because if both people aren't flourishing, if one person thinks they're flourishing and their spouse isn't, we got to know that person actually isn't flourishing. So that would be a low number. So hit me with some numbers. One. Six. Nine. 
This could be an acquaintance. This could be someone close to you. We're not, no one else is like, I wonder who they're saying. <laughs> we're just, we're just throwing out numbers Three. for the sake of throwing out numbers. What? Three. This is uncomfortable for everyone. <laughs> well, I don't want to. Well, if, if we get 10 guesses, we'll all have, we'll have all the numbers up there. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. Four. Yeah. Two. <laughs> all right, there we go. Thank you. Five. Thanks, Glenn. We just fill in it. No, we got to leave it because some people just want to. Oh, okay, I got to think of a number. I got to think of a marriage that's a seven so that we can finish our chart. Don't say it out loud. But how would you rate your own marriage or the marriages of those closest to you? Are they as good as they could be? And we all know that the reality is they're not because we're not all perfectly like Jesus. Let's talk about other presuppositions, things we believe, things that we bring into the marriage conversation what are some hindrances of marriage? What things hinder marriage to flourish? Presuppositions. If we have wrong expectations about marriage itself, what marriage is going to do for us, yeah. Hindrances, other hindrances? I'm always right. Okay, now, again, if we look out broadly, we're going to hear things like, communication and compatibility, but this stuff is about what we believe and our sin and our hearts. And so really sin, believing wrong things is the greatest danger. Sin in our lives is the greatest hindrance to our marriage. But let's flesh that out, how or why? Why is sin the greatest hindrance to our marriage? I think unless our relationship with God is good, we can't have good relationships with other people. Unless the vertical is good, the horizontal is not good. And sin breaks that relationship with the vertical relationship. Right. So in the Ten Commandments, one through four are about God, and five through ten are about man, and that's very purposeful in God's design. If, if our relationship with God vertically is not good, then we are not going to be able to have good horizontal relationships. Um, to be still on that, on that same line of thinking, essentially all sin Pride seeks the best from self, where love seeks the best for the other. So, in a way, sin is the exact opposite. It's not just slightly off. Right. Sin is the exact opposite of, of what's necessary. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, Tasha answered this in part, but why do we sin? because we're sinful by the nature of our connection to Adam. But if we've been made new creatures in Christ, why do we sin? Because of our human nature. Okay. But still, if we've been, if we've been made new... Why is there this ongoing presence of sin? It's 
It's a big question. Um, I would submit a simple answer. The reason we sin is because we fail to fully understand and apply the gospel. Do you struggle with anger? Do you struggle with bitterness? Do you have a hard time controlling your tongue? Now, we could answer that why question by saying, well, because you're not perfect. That's why you continue to struggle. Or we could say, well, yeah, you're not as much like Jesus as you should be, and that's why you continue to struggle. But underneath that, the reason that we sin is because we fail to embrace, that is, believe and cling to and live out the gospel, all that God has for us in the gospel. So turn to 1 Timothy 1.15. So right after Thessalonians, you'll hit Timothy. Okay, 1 Timothy 1.15. This is Paul writing to Timothy, his disciple in the faith. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Okay, we're going to talk about two foundational gospel truths that you need to apply to your life today because your presuppositions about the gospel may be killing your relationships. So the first one is this. Your sin is worse than you thought. Look at Paul's perspective about his own life. Christ came, to, Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Why would Paul say that? Why would Paul think that? Was it just because he persecuted the church? Maybe, but I don't think so. In Romans 7, we find that Paul said, I don't do what I know I should do, right? I, I, I know what I should do, and I want to do it, but I don't actually do it. Paul had this awareness of his own sinfulness, his own ongoing sinfulness. And so when he thought about himself, he viewed himself as the worst of sinners. Because of his history, I don't think so. I think it was because he understood even the present condition of his heart. That's why at the end of Romans 7, he's like, who will save me from this body of death? He's like almost in despair. And of course, he remembers Christ. And we'll come, we'll come to that. But he had a real awareness of sin in his life. Now, isn't this the same Paul who said, forgetting what's behind and pressing on to what's ahead? Well, yeah, it is. So which is it, Paul? Are we forgetting or are we remembering? And the answer is yes. Yes, because he reminded churches often to examine their own hearts. And, of course, the nature of the fact that he's writing letters and telling them not to sin is they're sinning. So there's the sense in which we always have to be reminded of our ongoing present sinfulness and need for Christ. And so this morning, do you know 
your heart well enough to see your own tendency to sin? Can you perceive your heart gravitate toward idolatry, wanting other things more than you want God? Are you aware that you tend toward anger or bitterness or worry or fear or gluttony or laziness or lust? Is all this introspection, your sin is worse than you thought, is that just dwelling too much on the negative? Too much thinking about our own selves? Well, it's possible. If we, if, we get, if we begin to just look at ourselves, that is a problem. But what we need to know when we're thinking about the presuppositions we have for marriage, we need to know that our own sin is worse than we thought. And the reason we need to know that is because if we don't, if we don't actually come to that place, we won't actually appreciate the gospel. We need to see how badly not only we needed Christ in salvation back then, but that we need Christ today. I have ongoing sin in my heart today, and I need Christ's work on the cross for me today. And so understanding this truth prepares us for the second truth that we need to see in 1 Timothy 1.15, and of course in the, re the rest of Scripture. Our sin is worse than we thought, and yours is, but forgiveness is better than you thought. <coughs> and of course, when we say forgiveness, we're actually talking about all that the gospel has for us. So if we were to include what else we have in the gospel, what would be some of those things? We, we not only have forgiveness in the gospel, what else do we have? What was that? We have communion with God. The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. Justification. Justification. We have adoption. life okay so when we and and the list goes on right it's it's a bigger list than that and when we realize that our sin is worse than we thought it was it prepares our hearts to taste the sweetness of the gospel one of the puritan writers said until sin be bitter christ will not be sweet if you haven't tasted the bitterness of your own sin, you will never appreciate what the gospel offers you. And that's why Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler the way he did. The rich young ruler was not prepared for the good news. His heart was not ready for the good news because he didn't get here. He, he did not realize the weight of his sinfulness, and at the end of their interaction, Jesus had really only got to this, and he went away sad, because his heart was still not ready, but if he had actually understood this, then he would be ready for the actual good news of the gospel. He who has been forgiven little loves little. So if your sin is not that big, then forgiveness from Christ is not that big. And think about how that applies to your relationships. 
in relationship, what do we do with our sin and what do we do with the people's sin around us? We magnify their sin and we minimize or justify or whatever our sin. That's, that's what our hearts normally do with sin. And so when we actually get this, how is that going to change our marriage? Well, we're going to see that even if our spouse did something wrong, sinned against us, were we totally innocent? Did we not have any attitude? Did we not have any word? Did we not have any thought that was not completely honoring to the Lord? Well, we'll soon realize that we did. And that sin is damnable. That sin, that little, your teeny little part of the problem put Christ on the cross and he suffered the wrath of God. He suffered hell on the cross for your 5% of the problem. Right? So, well, it was 95% of their, it was 95% of their fault. Well, your 5% was enough to condemn Jesus to the wrath of God. And so when we understand our sin is indeed worse than we thought, then all that God has for us in the gospel will actually have an effect. So think, continue to think about the gospel's effect on marriage. Does Christ, let's make it a how question. How does Christ's work on the cross inform the way you interact with your spouse in conflict? Or it doesn't even have to be your spouse, just another person in relationship. How does Christ's work on the cross inform your interaction? Should it inform your interaction with another person in conflict specifically? What else? I know that when Paul Walker was talking about this, he said, um, just remember that in your conflict, you may feel like you can justify your sin against that person when you retaliate or whatever, but you, you could have never given you a reason to sin against them. And I'm going to release you guys holding that I can think and remember when we are in conflict. Yeah. Yeah. God has never given us reason to sin against him. He's never sinned against us. Also, if I don't have the self-control that I should have in conflict, the likelihood that I'm going to continue adding sin upon sin is like Yeah, God's outside of time. Do you know that Jesus suffered for your present sins? So I don't really know how that works. But there's a sense in which as you sin, Christ is suffering additionally if we were to rewind the timeline. That's sobering. Think about all the times in scripture that the writers use Christ's 
work on the cross as motivation and example for believers. We ought to forgive in Colossians and Ephesians as Christ has forgiven you, so you should forgive others. Right? We are supposed to consider others because Christ considered us. Philippians 2. Consider others as more important than yourselves. Live in humility. Because why? Because Christ humbled himself. Therefore, when he was going to the cross, he was, a, he was counting you as more valuable than him. Sec, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 or 8, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor. What's the application? Paul's like, you should give, like money. You should give generously. Why? Christ had all the riches in the world and he became poor for your sake. Why would you think that it's right for you to hold on to your money? And so the gospel, Jesus' work on the cross, has the power to motivate and transform our marriages but I still, I still want us to spend a little bit more time here. Have you really drilled down into your heart? Have you seen the yuck there? Because if you haven't, you're gonna still, you're still gonna overemphasize the people around you sin, and you're gonna underemphasize your own sin. And so we need to spend a law, enough time there that our sin is actually bitter to us. And when we do, we will find that the gospel is tremendously sweet. And we will find Jesus' words will actually make sense. If you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. What? Does that mean like if you don't forgive someone, you're going to lose your salvation? No. It means if you don't understand the gospel enough to forgive, you don't understand the gospel. If you don't understand how much you've been forgiven, you will never be sinned against as badly as you have sinned against Christ. And when we begin to see that your marriage will be sweeter and sweeter. Until sin be bitter, the gospel won't be sweet, but until sin be bitter, your marriage won't be sweet. And as we actually taste, or your relationships, if, if you're just looking around you and you're not thinking specifically about marriage, as we taste the gospel, our relationships around us will be sweeter because they will all be colored by the grace that has been lavished on us. Next week, we will begin to talk about God's purposes for marriage. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for Christ. We thank you that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We thank you that you didn't spare your own son, but you condemned him for us. Lord, may we taste the sweetness of the gospel. May we taste the bitterness of our own sin enough to cause us to run again to the cross and be reminded how much we need the cross today. May we live in the shadow of the cross, understanding your great love for us, Lord. Pray all this in your name, amen.